So the sheet from yesterday, which was um, factoring quadratics and cube, sum and difference of cubes, um, you got the practice with those 12 problems. If you feel confident in them, great. If you're still rusty and you're getting them wrong, there is an optional, optional, like highlight that word as I'm saying it, Delta Math posted in Google Classroom. I would love to post an IXL, but we would only be able to do that once a day, and you might need to practice multiple concepts before our exam. It is right here, posted a new assignment. If you go to classwork, it's right here under Chapter R, Algebra 2 Review. It says practice with factoring. Um, in fact, let me type. Well, it just disappeared. All right. This is optional for anyone needing more practice with factoring. Might not be a bad idea for every single one of you just to go to it and look through the problems kind of in your head. Think, oh, I know what I would do there. I know what I would get. I know what I would do because there's um, there's a little bit of every level of difficulty but I'm not actually checking it, okay? Now, if you're struggling and you need my help, I do expect you to have tried that so that when you come to get help from me, I can look at it and see exactly where you need help. Um, but it is optional. Okay. Uh, we do end at 109 today. If you would... to one half. So while you're solving it, let me say something that um, is an overall theme in my classroom. It doesn't matter if it's my college class or my geometry class. I should be able to give you the answer and you still work. Right? If I give you the answer, you shouldn't write the answer down and be like, oh, okay, sure, it's one. I should be able to say, hey, the answer is one half but you still make an honest effort to try it. By me giving you the answer, I'm taking that pressure off of you. No. No. <laughs> it's rhetorical. Don't answer. I'm taking the pressure off of the whole, did I get it right or not? I'm telling you the answer. You're going to know if you got it right. What we need to do is fix it and find the mistakes if you got it wrong. So a lot of times I give the answer so you know immediately if you're doing it right or not. If you need a refresher, let's take a few notes. Might not be a bad idea to take them even though you might not need it. Um, this has to do with your order of operations. Now you may not have seen people write it like that. The M over the D, the A over the S. Uh, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. 
The reason that the M and D are stacked and A and S are stacked is because when you're simplifying the expressions, you always read it like a book from left to right to simplify. And the way you manage multiplication and division is just whatever you come to first. Multiplication does not necessarily have to happen before division. It's all about reading it like a book from left to right. Same thing applies with addition and subtraction. Now, parentheses and exponents, by golly, they go first and second in that order. But then the rest of it is however you read it like a book. So when you first start a multi-step equation, you are simplifying at first. We're going to clean it up. First, take the parentheses. If there's anything inside, there's not. Go to the front of it, distribute. Just bring this down. are no exponents, we don't have to worry about that. Second, it's like crossing the road. What are you, what are you taught to do before you cross the road? Look both ways. You got to look to the right and see if anything will combine. You got to look to the left and see if anything will combine before you start moving things to the other side. Okay, so it's like crossing the road. Look, check it, look, check it, and then you start moving. So right here I have 1 plus 6 that needs to combine. Now I have no like terms and it's time to cross the road. I'm going to say it like that. Now we're not simplifying. We are solving. When you're solving, you've got to condense your variables to one side. Then you move all addition and subtraction stuff away. Then all multiplication and division stuff away. Then you deal with exponents. Then you deal with any parentheses. So it's kind of like the reverse order. Okay. So looking at this right here, I do have the variable term on both sides. Doesn't matter which one you pick. I always move the one with the smaller coefficient because then I don't run into as many negative numbers. But it does not matter. I choose to move this one over here to its like term, bring down what has not been dealt with. Now my variable's on the right, I need to move the 7 by subtraction. At this point I shouldn't have to show my work. I would subtract the 7. Then I would divide by the negative 8. I would encourage you when it's like this to write it first exactly how you see it, then reduce it. Because a lot of people look at that and they want to say 2. Because your mind sees 4, 8, you just nicely think like, oh, it should be 2. It's actually 1 pound. So watch out there. Um, let's make a note that this is solved. So that's where we took the multi-step equation and we simplified it and then we solved it. That's linear. Now we're going to look at solving quadratics by three methods. You should know this. Quadratic formula, factoring, square roots, right? So let's label it quadratics. notes off to the side. Quadratics in standard form are of the form ax squared plus bx plus c. That's considered standard form. When you are solving, or to solve, less writing, to solve quadratics, you have 
several choices. Choice one is factoring. The problem is sometimes it will not factor. Choice two is square roots. You solve by square roots when there is only the x squared term. Like the bx term is gone. I'll show you what I mean by that when we get to that problem. It's the next one. So we're going to say bx term gone. I'm running out of room. bx term is gone. There's the quadratic formula, which works every time. Hence the reason it's the formula. There's also another technique which is called completing the square, which we are not going to do right now, but it will come up later. It will come up later. We're just writing it so that we're showing all the four different ways to solve quadratics. And actually there's a fifth way, which is graphing, but don't write that. When you are solving quadratics, if you choose to solve by factoring, then it has to be in standard form, which means it has to be equal to zero. This is not equal to zero, so the four's got to move. Now it's equal to zero. Now I can check and see if it's going to factor. I'm going to refresh you again on that whole little fraction method. You would come right here and say, okay, what number's here? There is an understood 1, a times c is negative 4, adds to negative 3. What would that be? Negative 4 and positive 1. No. I'm going to do um, a square root and a quadratic formula for that. So now we go to our parentheses. We're going to copy ax in the front, which in this case is 1x. Don't write 1x, just write x. We're going to copy the two numbers that we just came up with right behind it. And now you can see why the whole, when a is 1, do this, doesn't even matter. Because if you go the fraction method like this, it takes care of it. There's no GCF to reduce. So you're, you're done in terms of factoring. Now the question was solve it though, right? This is factored form, but I wanted you to solve it. Which means you need to get to x equals a number. All right, so watch this. You have this crap. Don't get lost in the, the polynomial, okay? That's what confuses a lot of people with math. You get tied up in the, the grade level stuff and you forget the basics. You have this crap times this crap, correct? And they equal what? They equal zero. What's the only way to multiply two things and get zero? There's only one way to do it. If one of those things is zero. Right? Let me repeat that question. What's the only way to multiply two things together and get the product of zero? One. If one of them is zero. We have no way of knowing which one of them is zero, but we know for a fact one of them has to be zero. So the way you finish this, you've heard this before, is called the zero product property. It's saying, hey, if two pieces of crap multiply to give you zero, then one of them's got to be zero. So you just force both of them to zero and say, well, x could be 4 or x could be negative 1. And that's how you finish it. You pull each of the terms, the binomials out, force it to zero, and solve. And those are your answers.
Okay, so that's solving by factoring. You want to make a note over here? This was solving by factoring. Now what we're going to do is solve by square roots. problem is x squared minus 9 equals 0. So looking at this problem, you should notice that there's something different. There's no x term. There's only the square depth x squared. Enough. That's what I meant by the bx term is gone. It's, it, there's not, it's not there. Another way to recognize when to solve by square roots is when there's just a single x in the whole problem. If you look at it, there is only one term with x. Looking up here, there were two terms and they were not alike. That's your key difference. So this is solved by square roots. You don't have to. You could recognize that that's actually a difference of squares, and you could factor it by a difference of squares. But let's say it throws you off for some reason, and you're like, okay, I don't know how to, how to solve this. You might see that, oh, I can solve it by square roots. To solve by square roots, you're going to have to get what's being squared by itself. In this case, I need x squared by itself, which means the negative 9's got to go to the right. Once you have what's being squared by itself, then you can take the square root of both sides. And then you do have to remember, this is really important, when you take the square root of 9, it is not 3. Minus 3. Big difference. Two totally different numbers there. So if you leave off the minus, plus or minus, that means you've left off negative 3, which means you only have half the answer. So you have to make sure to get that plus or minus. Um, in terms of taking notes, black. Alright, uh, we can make a note. Notice there's no bx term. And so what you do is isolate. It's either going to be the x squared or sometimes it's going to be parentheses squared. And what I mean by parentheses squared, I'm going to give you another example. For instance, if you had four parentheses x minus 2 squared equals 16. Looks totally different than the last problem, but there's still just the one x, right? Don't call that a bx term, by the way, because that's not bx, that's x squared. It just hasn't been multiplied out. So there's just a single x in this whole problem. Let's get what's being squared by itself. The 4 would move by division. Then you would take the square root of both sides, because now you have this mess that's squared by itself. So you would square root both sides. As complicated as that looks on the left, the square root of something squared cancels. You would be left with just that x minus 2. The right, however, would be plus or minus, plus or minus 2, which means you actually have two equations here. You have an x minus 2 equals 2, 
And you have an x minus 2 equals a negative 2, and you would solve for both of them to finish that. <laughs> so you can say, like, I'll draw it separately. You've got x minus 2 equals 2, x minus 2 equals negative 2. Totally different equations. If you add 2, you get 4. Dang it, if it's crowded. You add 2, you get 0. So those are both examples of solving by square roots, but they do look a little different because one of them is just x squared and the other one is quantity squared. Now everybody's favorite, solving by quadratic formula. Remember this one? Do you want me to sing? Yes. Art? Yes. <laughs> I'm a little coarse today. In the car, I sound really good. All right. Now let's look at solving by the quadratic formula. Formula. Can't talk. Do I expect you to have the formula memorized? Yes. Yeah, I'm going to give it to you, but you should have it memorized. We had to memorize it in high school. My uh, teacher sang it to the tune of Frere Jaca. So here's the formula. X equals negative B plus or minus square root. B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. 2A. Couldn't have just been over 2, it's over 2A. And it's very important that I, you understand, while this is just a single equation here, I'm going to draw, change colors and draw an arrow to that plus or minus. That means there are two numbers here from time to time. It depends on the equation. There are the potential for two answers. Those two equations, one of them would be plus, one of them would be minus. Okay, so here's our example. We're going to solve 2x squared plus 5x equals 3. Now, honestly, this would factor, um, but we're not going to we're not going to factor it. We're going to just purposefully solve the quadratic formula, a nice clean problem. The very first step in solving by the quadratic formula is it must be in standard form, which means it must be equal to zero. If it's not, you're going to label your A, B, and C at least one or two elements incorrectly. Then you can see, no, no pun intended, you can see A, B, C. Now, I'm fixing to ask you to entertain the idea of a new technique because one, there's fewer mistakes if you go this way. Two, it's fun. It's fun. It's fun. All right, let me show you. So when I teach uh, quadratic formula, um, I used to teach it to like Alpha One or Alpha Two kids who struggled with math, and I had to come up with some type of technique other than plug it all in, clean it up, your answer is there. That did not work with kids who struggled with showing their work or who struggled with number sense. So then I came up with this technique I'm going to show you, and it's actually stuck, and I love it, and I encourage people to try it. Find discriminant first. Do you remember what the discriminant is? It's the stuff under, so radicand is another word for anything under a radical. In terms of the quadratic formula, the discriminant is this. Notice I'm not highlighting the radical. I'm only highlighting the b squared minus 4ac. The 
actual vocab word for that is discriminant. Not discriminate. Discriminant. Um, we're going to do this in two parts. First, you're going to find the discriminant. Now, that's a really big word. It's difficult to say. A lot of people confuse it with the other word that has nothing to do with it. So I have dubbed this the crap. The crap. You call it what you want, but the crap or the sheet. Find the sheet first. Sorry. Find this crap first, okay? So B squared minus 4AC. You're going to love this. It makes life so much easier if you find that crap first. See, this is why I'm talking. So we're going to plug it in. B squared minus 4AC. So we got 5 squared minus 4AC. You can do it in your head or you could go to your calculator and you could type all of that. You will always come to a nice number. Might be big, but it's a nice number. 49. Yes. Here's why we find this first. Notice there's no radical here. Because sometimes when you're doing the quadratic formula, you don't get a pretty number. And if you were to type the radical in your calculator, it would produce a decimal, which would then drive you nuts. So we take the radical part off. We just find this crap, which will always, by design, be a nice, pretty number. Then we now finish the problem, but when we get to that crap in green, we don't have to do anything but write 49. 49 which makes life so much easier when you go to clean it up. So we're going to finish the problem. Bless you. X equals negative B plus or minus square root of that crap, which is 49, all over 2 times A. Now, doesn't that look a lot easier to clean up than the whole, if you had like just shoved everything into the whole, uh, formula. You also can see, oh, that's going to be 7. Yes. Whereas before, if we had that mess in this whole thing with the other stuff, your mind's going to just think, good grief. Why math? You see? Cute. All right, we're going to clean it up. We got negative 5 plus or minus 7 over 4. Those are all numbers. They're integers. Which means we can keep going. Right? You're actually going to find that when the quadratic formula um, has a pretty square, perfect square discriminant, it's annoying because your problem keeps going. If this was an ugly number, say 47, if that had been square root 47, we would be done. So this is where, like, the ugly numbers are actually the shorter problems. The perfect squares, you have to keep going. So we're going to separate this. We've got negative 5 plus 7 all over 4. And we've got negative 5 minus 7 all over 4. You could go and type those in your calculator or you could do them in your head you should get one half and negative three. Now what's the beauty of solving equations? Do you remember? Or if your teacher never taught you, shame on them. What can you do before you move on to the next problem? Check it. You can check it. Plug it in. Go to your calculator. You can, I would encourage you to plug it into the original in case you accidentally made a mistake right here, which, you know what I mean? Um, so what you would do is plug it in, in this case, just one side, because there's no, no variable on the right. So you would plug negative 3 in here, and you better get what? 3. three. You would plug, I wouldn't plug one half in, I would plug, you know, 0. 0.5, no, you have to put 0, 0. 0.5. In here, you should get three. So, those are the nice things about solving equations. Is you can guarantee you got it right. All right, this is Holcomb's technique where you find this crap first. We're going to write an arrow to this. And we're going to write find this crap. Then you plug it in. Alright, the last type of equation.
equation has nothing to do with quadratics. It's called literal equations. Literal equations doesn't mean like literally. It means like literacy. Literacy has to do with reading, right? Yes. Literal equations are equations with mostly letters. So let's take notes. These are literal equations. They throw some people for a loop. I personally, um, I enjoy them because there's fewer calculations because they're letters. So we're going to write the problem. And then now we're going to solve it. I do make my lowercase l in um, cursive so it doesn't accidentally look like an i, or I mean a 1. Here's what I need you to think of. When you have literal equations, I need you to think of like wooden blocks with these expressions painted in front of them. So like here's a block with 2L on front of it. Here's a block with 2W on the front. Here's a block with a P. And you're shifting them, okay? So we've got to get L by itself. It would help to draw an arrow above it. The same rules apply that when you're solving multi-step equations. You need to move all addition and subtraction stuff away first. So this block of two W's got to go to the other side and it will become, when it moves to the other side, it's going to become negative. negative. So this would come down. Now it helps to show your work. I'm going to subtract it from itself, which cancels. I'm going to go to the right and subtract it, but there's no like terms over there. Very rarely are there like terms in literal equations, which is why I like them because it just it just tacks on to the end. You know what I mean? You, if you'll show your work, you write what you see. I see P minus 2W. That's what I'm going to write. And then what's in the way of L being finally by itself? A two. A two. two. How's it attached? Multiplication. So we move it by division. Now sometimes I would say come underneath each one, but in this case, since it's literal equations, there's nothing wrong with writing it like this. What if there had been a 2 right here? You would have to keep going. And that would mean that there's a 2 in front of every single term. And you would divide everything by 2. So know when you can and when you cannot do that. If you need to, you can draw a line and say, what if? What if our answer had come to this? Now, I know there was no two up here with the P. I'm not saying that. I'm saying what if we had a problem and we got down to something like this? You would have to keep going. This two would take a two away from every single term in the top. And your answer in that case would have been this. So there is a difference. We didn't get to that, though. We had this. But I'm just saying if we had one like it. Um, let me show you another literal equation. Solve for A. Thank you. 
fly to the right, it will tack behind the C as negative, right? Then divide by what? X. Divide everything by X, which like I said, this is a literal equation. Oh, I wrote X. Sorry. Never mind. We're getting myself A. Thank you. This is a literal equation, which means a lot of times there's nothing to simplify. There's no like terms. They just, it's like blocks. They just move by the operation that would get them to the other side. This one's different in the way that you would start it. What do you notice? What are we solving for? Yeah. We're solving for B and there's multiple. That's your clue that there's a GCF. Which there can be GCFs of letters, right? Notice it helps if you have a highlighter. <coughs> notice that this B is in both terms. Terms are separated by plus and minus signs. So if I factor a B to the front, there was two terms to start with. There better be two terms in the parentheses when I factor that out. What would I be left with? One plus C. And then I'm going to bring this side down. Now I need B by itself. What's in the way? One plus C, D is in the way. Think of it as a block. It's attached to B by multiplication. It would move by division. Just imagine this being a block that's moving by division up underneath the A. You might want to make a note on your paper, pointing arrows to the B, that this was a GCF. That's how we were allowed to do that. We didn't have GCFs in the other problems. We had just the one term that we needed to solve for. This was a GCF, multiple terms. Which uh, these parentheses? Imagine if it had been X plus, um, like 4X. Imagine if it had been that. What do they both have in common? An X. So you would divide an X to the front. So this would be divided by X. This would be divided by X. I would be left with 1 plus little 4. Right? So you've got to be able to factor. 